Hello, welcome to the world of Word. Coming up, another word in your attic. And if you enjoy this, visit our Patreon to find out more about our exclusives and our general work of national importance. The link is in the notes below. And now, on with the show. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view. Our special guest, Theo Delaney. Good morning, Theo. Good morning. How are you both? We're very well. We're doing this slightly earlier than normal because, I mean, only slightly earlier than normal because uh, it's Saturday morning, but you're on your way to do a radio show. Is that right? Yeah. Every Saturday morning, I do the Johnny Friendly radio show uh, from this very room. Right. And uh, it goes 10 (laughs) till 12. So thanks for getting up early. Oh, it's all right. No trouble. So tell us about the Johnny Friendly radio show. What does that consist of? Well, it's basically um, the the sort of the, the pitch for it is a wide variety, a very very wide variety of excellent records for discerning grown up music fans. All oh, right, there it is in a nutshell. Hey, it's a pretty big nutshell. Okay, it's but massive. Yeah, it's, it's a big. So yeah. now, n- normally on this date, I understand this is the main day of Glastonbury, Mark. Is that the case? Well, it is, exactly. Hence the whole nation supposedly are building little mini gas- Glastonbury's in their gardens, aren't they? With little tiny stages and erecting outdoor loos and, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, trying to synthesise some mud, you know, and watching it all on the telly. But yeah, it is. So it's pretty sad. It was the 50th too. Oh, right. So have you ever been there, Theo? Never. Because yeah. I... I, I all those things you just described, I don't think I could cope with any of them. <laughs> Dave is That's with you on thing. this. Dave I'm always gonna... used to say, rock and roll should always have a roof on it. I, I'm all for roofs, yeah, when it comes to rock and roll, definitely. I, I can't do all that stuff. But, um, but obviously, I mean, I've missed out so much. If, if I wasn't such a, such a delicate flower, I could have seen so many historic moments. And they've got them all, they're replaying them on the TV, aren't they? We watch, actually, I watch with my... Wife and daughter Beyonce last night on the BBC. Fantastic. We watched it too, and I thought it was unbelievable. It oh, was when you see those, you know, it's not it's not slow dive, is it? You know, it's this unbelievable kind of cabaret with constant dance routines. You know, all girl uh, band and, and astonishing. I know, and she's much more of my daughter's generation in terms of the fans, you know. And I, but I was watching it and thinking. You, you see the influences and where it's all come from, Diana Ross and Tina Turner and, and others. James Brown. And James Brown, absolutely. Yeah. And, and Michael Jackson, obviously, and Prince. But then you think, actually, she's actually better than any of them. She's taken a, a, a new level, the show itself, and her in particular, her stamina, her flawless singing in, in, in amongst all of that Phenomenal. incredible physical exertion is just astonishing. It's amazing. Yeah. So, Theo, just to, just to run through your, your wide range of skills, wide <laughs> range of guises in which you, you, you pop up. You're, you're a DJ, podca- <laughs> podcaster, both, you know, you, you take part, you're one of the hosts of the Spurs show, which I have occasionally been on. Yeah. Uh, but you've, you've also got your own podcast, which is Life Goals, which is, it was Mark, Mark was telling me, talking to me about it yesterday, it's, ba- it's basically Desert Island Goals, isn't it? That's how it works. That's it. You get a guess that it's for it's a football podcast, but you don't tend. I don't tend to get footballers or ex-footballers on. I get fans, interesting fans, and they relive the eight goals of their life. And so, obviously, it's, it covers a long. They tend to be our kind of age, so it, it goes from like the fifties or the sixties onwards. And then they also also choose a record to go with each goal. So what you get is eight eight great little stories. You get the football, which I, I love. I'm obsessed with football. You get the music, which I love usually never know what they're going to choose and um and you get great stories from different you know it's very evocative Who, who's been your favorite guest so far i i would hesitate to choose a fa- i tell you who's been particularly outstanding kevin day was brilliant right he was the first one john crace from the guardian very very good Stuart Cosgrove I had on recently. Do you know Stuart Cosgrove? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. He, yeah. was, he was fantastic. But uh, honestly, they're all good. I mean, I wouldn't... Boyd Hilton's been on. He's also been on this, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. I heard your Lloyd Cole one, which I thought was fantastic. He describes being was... on stage at Glastonbury, in fact, when, yeah. when Maradona scored the hand That's of right. God. Things like that are perfect <laughs> for life goals because you get the music, yeah. you get the history and all of the moments, you know. Lloyd Cole was brilliant. He was um, so knowledgeable. But, and also really funny, deadpan funny, you know. Yes. So I've got to ask you, because you're our football correspondent, because I have not engaged with the game since it supposedly returned really? about a week ago or whatever. Right. Well, There's what's... a winner, Dave. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, I realise. <laughs> I realise. No, that I do know. Yeah. They, but the, the whole business of the crowd noise. Explain that to me, Theo. What's going on? Because you were you were tweeting about that last night, weren't yeah. you? In the course of a Brentford game, is that right? God, what yeah. what's going on? Well, I don't know, but they, they seem to get it a bit better every time because basically it's like a sound design is what we call it in the ad game sound design, you know, where you, you, ba- you, you get all of these. And they, I think what they do is they go game to game and they take in different effects and different bits of library. They must be scouring for bits of library sound. So in a game like last night, they found an actual Brentford chant. Oh, come really? On Brentford, come on, Brentford. <laughs> That's brilliant. Yeah, and it's there all the way. But, of course, in reality, what happens when Brentford sing, come on, Brentford, is the other set of fans would immediately retort, fuck off, Brentford. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I was, Who are you? Yeah. I thought they actually had put that on, either inadvertently and that's what I tweeted because I thought, wow, they've really gone for full authenticity here. This is great. <laughs> I love it. So I think they're getting it better and better. But there is something really odd about listening to concoct. It's like canned laughter, obviously, and it it just feels every now and then you remember and you think, this is weird. This is. I feel yeah. an idiot. I feel like an idiot listening to this while I'm watching this. And actually, sometimes I choose because you've got the option. Sometimes I watch it with no no crowd noise, and I just listen to all the players swearing at each when other. When you hear those players then shouting at yeah, each yeah. other, you hear every word they say, which is hilarious. Well, you, you hear quite a lot, and it's, um, I actually probably just prefer that. Yeah. 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 It's funny about canned laughter. Somebody told me years ago that um, the much of the canned laughter you hear on like con- uh, contemporary sitcoms, even now, were laughs, first laughed to the Lucy show in the 1960s. Wow. Because people laughed right. in a different way back then. They wow. were more open there where the laughter, you know, it's, it's, it's very different now. So the laughs you might be hearing while watching Friends, or I know that's not on right now, but, you know, while, while watching Friends might have been laughed by somebody who's been dead a long, long well, time. Well, that was, yeah, that was a just, spooky idea. They're nearly all dead, all the people. <laughs> yeah, so how have you been getting on in these uh, curious times of the last few months? Have, have you been reviewing your life, where it's going? <laughs> have you been auditing your possessions? Have you, been, yeah. have you had any Maria Kondo uh, kind of uh, moments? No, uh, well, I haven't been. One of the things I do is I'm, my day job is I'm a director of commercials and things like that. So I haven't been able to do any filming, of course. But everything else I do, I can do from here. I can do all the podcasting and interviewing and you know, editing and anything. So, and, you know, a lot of people have said this. I've actually found it quite nice. It's quite relaxing. You're not under pressure to get anywhere or get the, you know, you just do everything from here. I'm spending a lot of time with my daughters, which is fantastic. Um, I've got quite a lot done. But in terms of auditing and, and doing anything like this room that I'm sitting in now is my, my office. So I walk in here. I've been walking in here every day for what is like three months now, isn't it? And every day I walk in and say, I, "You know what? I think I'm going to get this place sorted out. I'm going to, I'm going to stop and get all the CDs catalogued like they used to be, and just genuinely tidy up and have a clear out." And every single day I don't do it because, of course, you sit down at the computer and you're away, and you, you could go in, you could end up anywhere, couldn't you? So I, I've done none of that. I'm as disorganised as ever. Right, uh, right. But I've quite liked it, to be honest. Have you got anything to show us? No. <laughs> oh, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. <laughs> I've got things to show you. Okay, I'm. I've got. The, I'm going to do it vaguely chronologically. Oh, okay, fine, fine. Occur fine. to me that yeah. that might be the best thing. And the first thing I'm going to show you. This is a. This is what we. I am a. I am a director. So I'm going to do a reveal now. All oh, right. There is the reveal. Oh wow! Oh, fantastic! That? Yes. What is that? What's the thousand pounds for? What's that? How does that relate? Okay, I'll read it out to you. A thousand pound will be paid to anyone dying of fright during the performance of Screaming Lord Such on Monday the 21st of January at the Big Beat Club, Harrow and Weald Memorial Hall, brackets opposite bus garage, routes 114-158-209. Literally the least frightening person on stage. (laughs) (laughs) The most unutter buffoon. <laughs> Usually seen on kind of parliamentary platforms Absolutely. trying to get elected. Absolutely, raving loony party, of course. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that is actually from the reason I've, I've picked that out is because that is a poster from my dad's rock and roll club, the Big Beat Club, oh, wow. which was uh, oh, right. which existed between I think sixty and sixty five. So in the early, so at that point, my dad is like got really like everyone else been absolutely 
taken over by rock and roll. Elvis has happened, Little Richard, and he loves it all. And it's occurred to him that all of the other young people, so he's probably, he'll be about 25 at this point, will he? Yeah. No, 20. He's 20. And he's, um, he's thinking, no one can, there's nowhere to go for all of, we all love rock and roll, there's nowhere to go. There's hardly anywhere in London at that stage to go and see, especially live. So he does a deal with the local um, Memorial Hall, the Harrow and Wheelstone Memorial Hall, and runs really successfully a, a rock and roll club for five years. And they had amazing people there. They had the Animals, the Moody Blues, oh, wow. the Who, uh, turned down the Beatles on account of they asked for too much money. That was the only reason. And he, <laughs> he wanted the Beatles and he loved the Beatles. But 25 he, guineas, probably. Yeah, it was something <laughs> like, he just thought, we just can't make this. We, we can't. We'd have to put the admission up. And I don't think, I, I don't think people would do. pay. <laughs> I don't think people would pay. Yeah. In hindsight, he thinks they probably would, but. He also turned down the Rolling Stones because they were trouble. He thought they were trouble. They had a reputation of being a bit, I mean, the hair was a bit long and they had possibly yeah, yeah. a dodgy following. But five years he did and they made, him and his brothers, his brothers helped him, his younger brothers. And uh, yeah, they were the coolest guys in Harrow and Wheelstone, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and, they made, and they did well, you know, they made some money and he met all these people. And in fact, he had the searchers and Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Rousers there as well. And he ended up being... He, let, he shut it down and became the road manager of Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Rousers. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. And uh, now, is there, isn't there a Tottenham connection there? Because yes. surely, go on, I'll leave it to you. Go on. Chaz. Chaz. Chaz, Chaz, Chaz and Dave was in Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Rousers. That's right. So when Chaz came on the Spurs show, which he did a couple of times, absolutely lovely bloke. Lovely man. And I said to him, I think you know my dad, thinking he'll never remember. He remembered him vividly. We had great chats about him and my, because my dad was, he said, oh, he used to look after me because I was the youngest one. The others used to gang up on me, but he used to, you know, he used to give me a lift home and all this stuff. So it was great meeting Chaz. Oh, also, well, yeah. Go and on. the Rebel Rousers were a good band, you know, and of course, one of their biggest hits was... Um, the Beatles song, Got to Get yeah. You Into My Life. Exactly, and, and my dad tells the story of how they're recording that, and because McCartney, had, he was so fertile, as we know, he had, he had so many brilliant songs, he was just dishing them out to his friends, and he, he said, oh, you can have that if you want, brilliant song, you know. And they went to record it, but the piano part was really, really tough. So Cliff Bennett rang up, or they, they ended up on the phone, Paul McCartney says, hey, getting on with that song, and he said, it's great, but the pianist can't get his head, he can't seem to, he said, oh, don't worry, how long are you going to be there? And he, he drove over and just, did the piano bit, Paul oh, McCartney, yeah. just to help him Because yeah. yeah. Chaz also used Brilliant. to tell the story of, um, on the, he, he, they toured with the Beatles, didn't they? I, I think, I think so, Cliff yeah. Bennett. And, and this must have been the time of Re Revolver. Now, got to get you into my life, he's on Revolver, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, I that's think, right. As yeah. is Yellow Submarine. And Chaz told the story, told it on the Word podcast when I, years ago, and I talked to him about hearing yellow submarine on an acetate being played in a dressing room on that tour and 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 people couldn't keep a straight face because <laughs> it was the idea that you heard yellow submarine before you knew it was yellow submarine you know what I mean? yeah, because right. before it was a thoroughly accepted phenomenon yeah yeah it was just this th you're gonna put that on your album i oh okay yeah, you know, it, seemed, it didn't seemed, quite uh, fit with the whole psychedelic concept at that point. No, no, it was no, just no, a no, kind no, of no, daft no. Child, children's tune. Children, children's record, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, novelty. Yeah. But that's a beautiful poster, that thing. Fabulous. Right? It's, and it's that's, fabulous. The, that's an original, it's the original wood printed, wood block printed poster. And there's a few of them. There's a, there are others. Um, I've got another one. And various members of the family. He, he's the oldest of eight children, so I've got loads of cousins. And, and, and most of us have got at least one. <laughs> these incredible artifacts and they're, they're really nice and he reckons my dad ended up being in advertising uh, and he reckons that's the first ad he ever wrote but he definitely it wrote is, it is. It's, it's an a, ad it's a very simple effect of yeah. Yeah. Uh, advertisement no, no, how could you not carry on reading that poster when you see the thousand <laughs> that, pounds it's it so how? true do i you get a thousand pounds somehow <laughs> you even you fell for it all these years later didn't you? i did oh, i said how did that correct? Correct? what's that what's the connection yeah, it's genius. It's absolute genius. Very good. What else you got there, Theo? So, so then, so now I'm going to go to the early 70s. So my, well, my dad, so he, he went off with the Cliff Bennett and the Rebel Rouse. Then he got poached by the Searchers, went round the world on tour with the Searchers and oh, the Who and the Stones, man. came back, and it, being the late 60s, so I'm born in 65, and it's the late 60s, 
early 70s and he becomes a Trotskyite revolutionary who is intent on overthrowing the state. <laughs> He's Citizen and Smith, basically. Exactly. He is With a beret. Exactly Citizen yeah. Smith. He never liked Citizen Smith. People. When I was little, <laughs> I, I thought, why didn't he like it? <laughs> and then later on, I thought, oh, that's why I didn't like it. He was. <laughs> But he, um, so by the time it comes to the early 70s, we've got no money at all because he doesn't believe in capitalism in any way. We're living in a rented <laughs> this, flat. This is the man who ended up in advertising. Exactly, yeah. yeah. He's now, by the way, he's now a member of the MCC. And was offering, <laughs> yeah, yeah. At that point, he was a member of the Workers' Revolutionary Party. <laughs> I doubt anyone else has achieved that double. <laughs> anyway, in the, by the, we get to the early 70s. We're living in a small flat in... Um, Chiswick, Chiswick Village. You live in Chiswick, Mark, right? I do, you're absolutely right. Okay, so Chiswick Village are these sort of 30s blocks in a, yeah. around a green. I know. Right near Gunnersby Station. And um, he's a total hippie. And, you know, we're growing up in this flat with, with, where the, the air is thick with joysticks and mar marijuana the whole bloody time. But he's got this great record collection. He's still really into music. He's got the most fantastic record collection. And I think of your book, the 1971 book, because that's when we're talking about. Yeah, yeah. And I was looking through my CDs, and of course, when CDs came along, I lost all my vinyl because I moved about so much as I went, as I grew up. But I rebought everything, everything and more, you know, when CDs came out. And I just dug this out. This is a, he had, we basically, oh, listened. American we about, Beauty by the Grateful Dead. Yeah. So oh, we yes. were about, when I was about six, we were on a, a musical diet of the Grateful Dead, Neil Young, Joni Mitchell, the Beatles, the Stones, a little bit of Elton John, James Taylor. All of that kind of amazing early 70s, mostly the West Coast type stuff, but other also British stuff as well. We also had all the 45s left over from the Big Beat Club. So we had things like Neil Sedaka, um, the Everly Brothers, uh, Chuck Berry, you know, all of that, you know, Hey Baby by Bruce Chanel. And Bruce Bobby, Chanel. Bobby yeah. V. Yeah. yeah. All of that stuff on 7-inch. And we had all of this amazing sort of AOR New, which we, what, new stuff at the time, singer songwriter stuff at the time, and then the third thing was Top of the Pops, of course. We were, so we were well into Slade and the Sweet and all that. And uh, but my dad was an absolute rebel. He's at the moment he's hermetically sealed in his flats, and we won't come out because of the um, <laughs> no, because of the virus. He, he's refusing Playing American Beauty by the Grateful Dead over and over again. <laughs> but, <probably. Yeah. laughs> but he um, he was putting the skins rebel. together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was a massive um, rebel at that stage, and probably still is actually. But he, uh, so he, so it was very confusing being the child of parents like this because, on the one hand, they wanted you to do all the things that other other parents want you to do, which is like knuckle down, do your homework, and be nice. And but on the other hand, they they had a thinly veiled contempt for all authority, including teachers and police and everything like that, because he, he was an absolute raving um, trot, you know. And so <laughs> raving trot. Like, he'd do things like when it was school photo day, they'd sit around going, Oh, the school photo's so naff, man. I mean, it's like, you know, everyone has to go, cheesy grin and in, in, in their bloody uniform. And they, then they had an idea. They said, I know what we'll do. We'll send the kids to school, but we'll tell them not to smile because we've got to pay for this photograph. They mustn't smile and we'll send them. What about what's that great Beatles cover? We'll send them in, we'll, we'll get a photo out of this. Will be really worth the money. We'll send them to, to look like they, the Beatles did on to that. You see that? They sent us oh, in to the school photo. Oh, it's reflecting off the screen. There that's you go. That's all right. That is fabulous. Oh, what so haircuts. They, they wanted us to look like, that's me at the top. And there's my okay, so. so they wanted us to look, they wanted to rip off. It's with the Beatles, I think, isn't it? Where they all got the black polo next. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But unfortunately, we were unable to not smile because the photographer was so insistent and we were too timid to refuse to smile. Yeah, you yeah, wouldn't do that, would you? They were disappointed with that. And <laughs> they, of course, there was this back, this cheesy photographic backdrop of a blue sky, which didn't really... Yeah, it wouldn't work really for, us, for but it somebody in advertising. It was a kind of strange household we were living in, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lovely it's idea that he was subverting everything, wasn't he? <laughs> That's yeah. hilarious. He wanted to subvert <laughs> everything. And we, so you sort of... It was true. We all had that long hair. No one else at school had long hair. No other boys had long hair. They all had short hair. You know, they all had short hair and anoraks. And we were going to school in denim jackets and jeans, flared jeans, long hair. 
And on the one hand, it was quite cool, but on the other hand, it was like we, we got terrible stick for it. As yeah, you want to fit yeah. in, don't you, yeah. when you're when Not you're a idiot. child? We yeah, yeah. Fit in at all. Anyway, what else have I got here? Let's have a look. So the seventies go on. The old boy ends up in advertising, which his his brothers are doing, and leaves, leaves, and we're on a council estate in Brentford. <laughs> Me and my brothers and my mum, and punk happens, you know, which is obviously a recurring theme in this thing. And I basically this my next big influence, my next big thing after the old boy left, I needed a new influence. So uh, it's uh, it was of course the man who always crops up in these things. All oh, right. Oh Elvis yeah. Kinder. Elvis. Oh, that's actually what date's that ticket that ticket actually is a bit later that ticket is i think around about 83 because judging by the typography on that i reckon that's punch the clock era yeah something yeah. like yeah. that yeah, yeah. But, tottenham well, main fan where's the yeah. tottenham main fan well exactly that's why i think it's i don't do th i don't really keep tickets and stuff i don't catalog all that sort of stuff but i for some reason i've still got this and i think i must have been sentimentally attached to it because it's tottenham oh, there you go yeah I mean, in those days, I used to go and see, I'd gone through a phase of seeing those of punk bands, and then, you know, I used to go and see bands, and you'd always go to, I'd seen Elvis, I saw Elvis at the House of the Palais, the Odeon, the Albert Hall, Roundhouse, I used to go and see punk bands at the Lyceum, and the, and the 100 Club, and Marquee, and everything, but no, not the Tottenham Mayfair. I mean, what the hell was that? So I'm I, trying to think where the Tottenham Mayfair is. Well, I looked out this morning thinking maybe I ought to find out. And it was on the high street. As you go down from Seven Sisters Station towards White Hart Lane on the high street, it was on the left. It's not there anymore. They knocked it down and built a load. So that's what it was the, the Royal, wasn't it? Pre yes. in a previous, it's where Dave, exactly. the Dave Clark Five used exactly. to play back in present. the day. That's yeah, exactly okay. it. Okay. But by this time, no one was playing there at all. It was mostly disco no, no. and stuff like that. <laughs> no. So I don't know what he was doing playing there, but I went and I remember it pretty well. Yeah. Um, I've got another Elvis Costello thing here. Oh, oh, very good. Oh, that's lovely. Oh, very good. So what's Is that, that a shop display thing? What was that? I don't really understand this because it's really solid. Oh, wow. That, that is, isn't it? It's a thick wooden thing. It's from, I think, that is the My Aim is True era. Because that's. Yeah, it sort must of... be around about that time. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. the kind of knock kneed Buddy Holly yeah, look. Exactly. It. Yeah, it exactly. is, yeah. But I got that not at that time, but years later, I was working in a film company after I'd become a commercials director, and the runner came in one day, and a really nice guy called Wayne, and he just came in out of the blue, struggling in with this big thing, and said, uh, I've heard you talking about Elvis Costello. Do you like Elvis Costello? And I said, yeah. And he said, do you want this? So I said, yeah, thanks very much. And I've had it ever since. Every office I've had since. That was the mid-90s. So and, uh, and now, let me guess, you're trying to think of a place to put it. Yeah, I am, actually. Yeah, where does it live permanently in your house? Probably nowhere. In the Mark, and I, Mark and I were doing, comparing notes on the same thing yesterday. He's, he's got a huge, great Bob Dylan cover. And I've got an enormous, great... Bob Marley feature, yeah. which most of the time lives behind a piano because you've got nowhere to put it. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It's mostly, usually you'll find it like that, stacked up with a load of other pictures in the corner yeah. of, uh, of a yeah. room. Yeah. Well, it's been waiting for this, uh, this opportunity now exactly. to be exposed. I'm so pleased. To be exposed to all it's what we're here for. I'm so pleased. But um, So Elvis, if you, uh, on my Facebook, where, it's, where you have to suppose, you're supposed to say what, you know, sum yourself up in a sentence. Mine just says, I like Spurs and Elvis Costello. Oh, it's as simple as that. Okay. Simple as that. That's oh, all you need to know. Simple as that. So, so Elvis, I've been obsessed with since, you know, 77. Have you ever worked with any of these people in your time com directing commercials? Any of, any of your rock idols? No, no, I haven't. But I've come, well, I have worked for Elvis. Elvis and I have had this strange, he, he's oblivious to this, needless to say, but we've had this strange relationship all over these years where I've worshipped him. I've got everything he's ever done. And I, I mean, I'm not one of those really amazing, because Elvis has really obsessive fans who are completists yeah. and, and, and I'm not that, but I've obviously got all of his albums and I've loved, I've seen him 20 times or whatever. But I've had all these brushes with him over the years. So when I was in my sort of early teens, I used to, I was a compulsive truant. I hated going to school. I was always playing truant. So the first time I saw him was I went to 
I used to bunk off and just hang around, mostly in Richmond, because my, the schools that I went to, I fell out with two or three schools, but they were in that area. Do you remember the Beggar's Banquet in Richmond? Did you ever, is Richmond something? Uh, right, yeah, well, well, didn't Rob Fitzpatrick used to work in there, Mark? Didn't yeah, yeah, I, I think, think he, he did. did. It was the record yeah. shop, you about a record shop. Yeah, well, it was a record shop oh, before did. it was a record yeah. label. Yeah, yeah, go on. Right in the middle of Richmond, and I was bunking off there one day like you do, doing the thing that we always did, that I learned from my dad, which is you go in a record shop and you spend three hours looking at every single yes, Absolutely, you read them. And yeah. then buy it, none it, of them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And every, yeah. maybe every seventh one you'd actually take out and go, oh, and then put back down. Yeah. So I'm doing that just a while away, two or three hours whilst bunking off. And this guy walks in with a big overcoat and dark glasses. Doesn't do what everyone else is doing, which is what I'm doing, but walks straight to the counter and says, I want this, yeah. that, yeah. that, 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 that. I ordered this, that, and that. And have you got that and this? And they're like, mm. and they'll go around and get this big pile of records give it to him, he hands over a credit card. I think, who is this? And as he walks out, he turns, I get a good view. It's him, it's Elvis. I'm thinking, wow, I've been in the presence of greatness. Yeah. And what authority to walk in like this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you restrain yourself from going up and talking to him then? Yes, I always, I try to always restrain myself in situations like that. It never goes well for me because I'm such a fool when, it, when anything like that happens. So, <laughs> uh, then I saw him a few years later in the Richmond Odeon one afternoon, bunking off again. He was there with, I think his, brother his young brother watching something like back to the future or top gun or something then i went to the doors premiere and he's there with kate uh caitlin um oh, kate Reard, yeah from the post yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and then so i'm thinking i'm thinking this is weird this is like me and elvis we always our paths always seem to cross years 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 go by and then he um releases his book which i thought was fantastic of course i would think it was fantastic. Was it long enough for you? Or, uh... <laughs> hey? <laughs> was I just it... wondering if it was long enough. I mean, it's... <laughs> I've I got it up here somewhere. It's the brick, more. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I could have I could have I could have read more, but I got on to um Penguin at the advice someone I know, my my sister in law works in public, she said, Elvis Sellers got a book coming out, you should get onto Penguin and offer to do something for it. So I got onto them and said, I want to make a thing for Elvis's book to help you sell it. Uh, I've got an idea for Instagram. And they said, all right, well, so I came up with this idea and they said, we'll have to give Elvis approves every single thing to do with the book. There's nothing, he doesn't leave it to anyone else. So he, he liked the idea and I ended up making a little ad for the book and I never met him, but he had to approve every element of this film. And what happened was the emails had to go via intermediaries because yes. <laughs> superstar. But what was great was about two thirds of the way through the process, they forgot to you know remove yeah, the yeah. from so the trail yes yeah, absolutely reading, everybody's i'm reading his slightly rude and abrupt feedback that he, which they've been sort of oh, really? dressing yeah. up you know, he's saying, he's saying, he like, loves it what is this one shit? little point yeah. who's this <laughs> arsehole <laughs> yeah get rid of him don't he, waste my time this cretin he's saying yeah. like, awesome all halfway through is an animated thing right so i'm not an animator so i'm just overseeing i've got a great animator called chris shepherd one of the great animators is also big elvis and, and we start making it. And my idea was you get all these faces of all the other celeb famous people that are in it. Because it's one of those books where everyone's in it because he knows everyone. So I thought that's a great way to sell it. Because even if you're not a massive Elvis fan, you're going to be a Bruce fan or a yeah, Bob yeah, Dylan fan yeah, or a Roy Orbison yeah. fan or whatever, Joni Mitchell. So I said, you want to get all the faces and they all want to just come in a really simple animation. And we'll do it to pump it up because pump it up's got this great, you know, pulsating rhythm. Yeah, perfect baseline, for the animation. Yeah. Perfect. So he loved this idea, they said. They said he bought it. So I'm halfway through. Now, animation is really painstaking. It's not like live action. You just do a different take or something. I mean, it's really, as you know, it's a very, very painstaking process. And halfway through, he just sends, casually sends an email saying, I don't want to do it. To pump it up, actually. I want to do it with uh, high fidelity. What, well, when you've already... <laughs> yeah, halfway through. Oh. And I said to them, yeah, well, yeah but we've just, we, we're halfway there. We, we'd have to start again. And they, well, he's, he's quite insistent. So I said, well, can't you just tell him that it's impossible to do? We literally would have to start again. We would never get it done in time. So then I start seeing these and he's going, well, what about watching the detectives? I prefer that. And it's, no, he's missing the point. Which is whatever we change. A useless it. track for a promotional purpose. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and then, and then this is where he gets rude because these emails are going back and forth. He goes, I don't understand this guy. Why didn't he choose every day I write the book? It's the obvious bloody choice. <laughs> oh dear. I said, 
Yeah, but it doesn't have the required tempo and rhythm for the yeah, animation. Yeah. And then it goes quiet for about 10 days. And then they just get into, they just phone up and say, oh, by the way, they took about a few other details. And they say, oh, by the way, obviously it's fine with uh, Pump It Up. <laughs> okay. it's, it's terrible. Classic. Well, that's, yeah. uh, that's what it always is. That's what yeah. happens in the music business. It's all about kicking the person slightly lower down the yeah. picking order. Yeah. Who then kicks the person down and yeah. then it gets transferred down. That's the way it works. You, you, know, you, 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 told, you told me you had a run-in with Roger Moore. Oh, Roger Moore. Yeah, well, I, I, as I say, I direct commercials is my main day job. I've, made, I've literally made hundreds of commercials. I worked out the other day that I, my first commercial... I made 30 years ago, so we do it 30 years. But my favourite of all the people, you know, all the famous people I ever worked with was Roger Moore because he was so funny. I've got a picture. I never, you know, you can't, as a director, you can't go asking for selfies. It just doesn't, it's not a good look at all. No, so no, I've got no. no pictures of me with anyone famous apart from this one. Uh, that's me and Roger. Oh, I bet, yeah. oh how, Very how impressively good. orange skinned he is. Oh, yeah. The only sad thing is he's not wearing a terry toweling dressing gown. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably the script ah, before the tuxedo, yeah. yeah. But he was brilliant. And he, he wanted to shoot, it was for a, a, a beer, a Midlands beer called Banks's Bitter. And he wanted to shoot in Dublin for tax reasons. He lived in Switzerland. So I said, fine. So we get to Dublin. And normally I would meet, the, if it's really big celeb like that, I'd want to meet him in advance so that, that you know, we, we kind of got the, the cut of each other's jib beforehand. But he flew in the night before. And I always have this thing where the night before a shoot, I'm in bed by nine, no drink, nothing, so I can be, you know. So I didn't get to meet him until the day of the shoot. So we're shooting in a pub and uh, I'm getting it all ready. And then I hear, oh, he's arrived. He's in hair and makeup. Go and meet him. So I went to meet him. And he was very um, relaxed, didn't say much. I said, explain the script a little bit. Yeah, so I think I can manage that. And so I went back on the set. Then he, I said, right, very good impression. That's very yeah. good. So he comes on and I say, right, this is the idea. This was the idea for the ad. I said, you walk in the pub over there. The whole pub suddenly goes silent. Everyone looks at you and you walk through the pub and you say, you know, the trouble with being a world famous mega star is uh, nobody ever gives you a moment's peace. Then you get to the bar. Some bloke turns around and says to you, you you're him, aren't you? And you say, yes. And then he says, can I buy you a pint? And then he turns to camera and says, see what I mean? You can't get any peas at all or something like that. That's the idea for the act, right? Because he loves Banks a bit. So he says, yes, yes, I, I understand. So I said, I'll tell you what, I like to shoot the rehearsal just in case the magic happens first time. So very good idea. So he comes in, roll the camera, walks into the pub. Everything's great. Everyone goes, he walks through, says his line to perfection, gets to the bar. And the guy turns to him and says, you're him, aren't you? And he goes, Fuck off! <laughs> and point, then turns to you and says, was that the one? Have we got it? Yeah. It's a keeper. There's a yeah. split second silence. And then I just completely collapse. And then the whole pub, you know, I, everybody's in fits. I just thought to myself, this is going to be absolutely brilliant. It was completely deadpan. He, he said, should we do another one? <laughs> <laughs> that Every, is everybody always says Everybody always says nice things about Roger Moore. I never met him, but everybody said he was a charming man. He was brilliant throughout this shoot. He was so helpful, but also so funny. Loads of great stories and stuff. And on the last night, I said to him, you always say, you know, you always go out on the last night and have a big piss up. And you always say to the celeb, if there's a celeb, do you want to come? And they always say, oh, I'd really love to, but I can't because of it all. <laughs> I said to Roger, we're going out tonight to, to have dinner and we'd love you to come. And, and he says, oh, I'd love to. And I said, no, I understand. Sorry, what did you say? And he said, <laughs> I'd love to come out for dinner. So I said, oh, oh great. So we, we went and met in the Clarence, which is U2's posh hotel. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Quite new yeah. then. Quite new then in the middle of... Uh, he walks in the bar. It was like the commercial. You know, the yeah, whole bar. He like, would be. Yeah. yeah. And then we go in and he's, I, I can't believe it. I'm sitting next to Roger Moore at dinner in the Clarence and it, it, he's drinking. Like we're, we're, everybody's getting really drunk. All the key crew are there and everything in the advertising agency. And then who should walk in but the cause? Do you remember the cause? Oh, oh yeah. I certainly do. Yeah. They were massive at the time. Oh, yeah. Really yeah. Huge. And they walked in and then... Um, uh, Roger I, would like that, wouldn't I he? I think he would be quite keen on the cause. <laughs> yeah. And possibly <laughs> Roger. Vice versa as well. The cause have just walked in and he's gone, the what? I said, the cause, you know, <laughs> the, 
I've never heard of them. Oh, well, they're, they're really big. They're just over there. Oh, oh, yes. So then we carry on drinking, carry on drinking. Someone else has said, somebody, and he's on to us, has come up to have a chat with him. He said, did you know that the, the cores are over there, Roger? He said, I don't know who the cores. Then the, th- well, the third person <laughs> who said it to him, by which time we're on the Calvadoses, which is his particular tip. Oh, good grief. Uh, I say, Roger, it's the cores over there. And he stood up and went, you yeah. there, give us a song. <laughs> give us a song. And they turned around, they hadn't, they, they hadn't seen him before this. They were like, Jesus Christ, it's James Bond. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what he was like. He was absolutely, he was fantastic. He was all, Did he was they? Like, Did they thing. give him a song? No, sauce? no, no. They were really, really actually quite freaked out, I think. I don't know. Where, I'm sure. They were like, oh, no, no, no. I, they were, they, t- they didn't compute. Hey, hey, so, I, I love those occasions where the balance of celebrity is completely disturbed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because if you're the cause at that time and you're yes. going to the Clarence yes. bar, you're, the biggest, you're, feeling, the, you're the biggest fish in there. Unless you two have come in, you are the biggest fish. And so you, and it's only the, half an hour later, you realize, oh, crikey, this James Bond. Massively upstage. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's extraordinary. Theo, it's been a delight to talk to you. Well, it's been absolutely my pleasure. I'm such a massive fan of these, so I feel like a competition winner. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and now to, to go off and entertain your public and your, your, next, uh, your next engagement. And what will no doubt be a busy weekend of entertaining. It will. I'll, I'll play one for you guys. Thank you very much. It's very nice to see you. It's hilarious. Lovely. Bye.